So now let's look at covariate shift. So let's start again with our cute kittens and dogs, right? And we build a classifier. And you know, that looks really great. And you know, assuming that I managed to do the proper regularization, everything ought to be fine, at least. So one would think. Unfortunately, it isn't because at test time, let's say I end up, you know, encountering cartoon animals rather than real animals. Now, this seems unfair, but I must admit that if you were to show those animals to a two or three year old, they would be able to generalize very nicely, probably actually better than adults. And they would say, yeah, okay, those here are cats and the rest are dogs. So now you wonder, you know, this is really stupid because, you know, who on earth would be so crazy to go and, you know, use that for, you know, classification. So why would anybody be that stupid? Well, it turns out that it's actually a really common issue. Let's say I want to build a web search engine and I go and train for page relevance on data on the United States market. Then I want to go and deploy it in Canada or in the UK or Australia. And I deliberately picked a locale where the language is the same. Okay, this is Canada without Quebec, of course. And, you know, I'm also ignoring, you know, the Scots and the Welsh and the Aborigines and all of that. But basically, let's assume they basically speak the same language. Then you would think that, you know, an American search engine will do reasonably well, but it would not do perfectly well. And so you would wonder, you know, is it possible to, you know, maybe reweight and re-emphasize those aspects of the data set that allow you to do well in Canada or in the UK or Australia? Or in speech recognition, maybe for training, you have some West Coast accent or maybe even some foreign accents like mine. And then for testing, you know, you deploy it in the Deep South or in Texas or a non-native speaker with a different accent from mine. So, you know, just because maybe the speech recognizer is trained on Bavarian accents doesn't mean that it does as well on French accents or vice versa, right? So basically you get some change in the distribution. Now, obviously, you know, they are still speaking the same thing, but it just so happens to be with a different accent. So that's covariate. You also get, you know, very significant things in terms of, you know, which terms are more frequently used for the same thing. So for instance, uh, during training, you might say, you know, James, bring me a soda or Alexa, order me a soda. And then, you know, at test time, maybe somewhere else, somebody might want to order a pop or a Coke online. Okay. So those examples seem to be contrived. Here's one that actually ruined the startup. So I, once upon a time, I was consulting for a startup back in Australia. And that startup had the habit of measuring first and asking second. And basically they wanted to build some blood test to detect, you know, prostate cancers or think of it like a very early version of what Grail Biosciences is doing now, but with a very different experimental protocol. Okay, be that as it may. So they had all the blood samples from, you know, the sick old men with prostate cancer, and that was quite a lot of work. And they were actually quite willing to donate their blood because, you know, they, most people, if they are affected by something might say, well, okay, it's a good idea to make sure that others don't get sick, right? So they were quite generous. The problem is they didn't have a lot of data from healthy men. And since the startup was on a university campus, they went out and cheerfully sampled the blood from university students. And university students being, you know, the cheapskates that they are, you can probably bribe them for a coffee or whatever to, you know, get stuck and donate their blood. And then they ran their very expensive test and came back to me and asked me whether I could design a classifier between healthy and sick. And needless to say, I told them that I could probably design a classifier that would be perfect, but that it would also be perfectly useless. And they were very sad when they heard this because they had just basically spent their last money on this. So it's 
Well, side note, they actually went bankrupt after that. And you can easily see why this is a problem, right? Because they basically sampled data from young men who have a very different metabolism, a very different lifestyle, probably a lot more alcohol intake, a lot more activity. Uh, well, you know, 20 year old male students behave very differently from 50 to 60 to 70 year old, old and sick men, right? Anyway, so that's basically why that data was completely busted. Now you get a slightly, you know, more common thing if you, for instance, want to solve reinforcement learning, because the issue is that the data has been gathered with a current policy. Now, if you do this and you update your policy, then, you know, unfortunately the environment react, reacted to your current policy. So if you change your policy, the environment may actually behave very differently. And as that happens, well, unfortunately, also your actions are now no longer optimal for, you know, what's currently going on and that just, you know, ruin things. Or another case would be that you go and train your databases you know, on the 2017 usage pattern, because that's when the engineer built the feature and then you deploy it and keep it deployed. And it was really good and it keeps on getting worse. And so you might have to ask yourself, do I need to retrain? Do I need to reweight, rebalance things? Okay. So these are just, you know, some very common examples. I would argue that covariate shift is really ubiquitous and it's almost impossible to avoid. Now, just to show you that, you know, the distribution of soft drink names, you know, is not completely made up. And you can see that in the deep south, everything's red and they drink, they call things Coke, whereas in California and Nevada, uh, they call things a soda and for the rest, it's a pop. And then, you know, in some places they call it whatever, but, Basically, you can see that depending on the region, right? So you have very different ways for calling things and that has appropriate consequences for then if you want to, for instance, order stuff and so on. So you need to address the covariate shift. So here's another real story and the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because this is probably one of the most common pitfalls that you'll run into if you go and, you know, deploy a system. So some startup wanted to actually show off a smart vending machine demo that identifies purchases with a camera. So this was after, you know, Amazon Go launched and a couple of startups wanted to show that they had something like this, such that, you know, maybe some other stores could also roll out an Amazon Go like feature. Alas, it's not quite that easy. And so they built the stuff that worked well at home and then they wanted to demo it at CES and the different lighting temperature and light reflection from the table really messed it up. So if you, you know, look at this region here, for instance, underneath there are actually some lights that are RGB lights. And you can see here, there's some other lighting happening and basically this is Las Vegas, right? And they like to, you know, spice things up and, you know, make it nice and flashy and colorful. And unfortunately, flashy and colorful in all sorts of different colors messes up your object recognizer. Now, if you have a really shiny table, then that reflective surface messes it up entirely. So what they did is they basically went off to collect new data they went to get some tablecloth to kill the reflections and then they retrained the system all night and hoped for the best and it actually worked out okay. So their demo worked. So what's really happened is if, you know, this is the original source and I want to go from the source to the target, then the CS source was, you know, like so. And so what they tried therefore then is to try and see whether they can move it in a way such that, you know, the now updated source is closer to the original. So let's look at it in terms of math because intuition is great and intuition is great in order for you to help you detect what's going on. 
but it's not so good if you then actually want to fix it specifically. So the salient assumption in covariate shift is that q of x and y is given by q of x times p of y given x. So why is that the case? So these are the covariates. And this is the actual, you know, labels for a given object. So what that means is that if I have a certain, you know, covariate, then the label distribution ought to be the same on training and test set. But the distribution of a covariates may be quite different. Okay. So if I want to minimize the risk, so that will be basically the risk under P of the loss of f of x and w and y. That's what you want to minimize, right? So I can write this out as an integral. You know, this has a term P of x and y in it. And I can split it up into p of x and into p of y given x. And the thing is that the second term remains unchanged. And the first term needs to be changed, right? Because in the, the first term, here now I have an integral dq. The rest is the same. Right, that's the same expression as what we had up before. So how to fix it? Well, a very simple thing is if I have an, an integral dx q of x times f of x, I can write it dx p of x times q over p. So if you look at what I did is I basically divided by p and I multiplied by p. And that's what allowed me to write the integral dp of x. And so I now can write it as an integral with regard to the original distribution times some density ratio between q and p. Now, why is this a good idea? Well, because actually getting that density ratio can be a lot easier than de deriving, you know, and estimating q and p. Imagine that Q and P are distributions over artwork by Picasso, right? And I think it will still take a while until we are able to design algorithms that exactly work like Picasso, right? But what you might be able to do is you might be able to say, well, okay, I want to have a little bit more of this and less of that and to reweigh things accordingly. And in order to do that, you don't necessarily need to be able to generate things, you just need to reweigh. So for instance, if I want to have a covariage of correction of Picasso in such a way that he looks more like Georges Braque, and at some point those two guys hung out and they drew paintings that are ridiculously similar, then what you would simply have to do is you would have to out overweight all the Georges Braque like Picasso paintings and downweigh all the other things that he did. So it's more still life and less Guernica. Now, you know, the point is that you can actually do this quite efficiently by, you know, performing label shift and uh, covariate shift and by getting the weighting correctly. So let's have a look at what this actually means in practice. So what I've done already is I've engineered myself some distribution R which is a mix between P and Q. And so this delta term here is just, you know, you know, the Kronecker delta. And it means that if Y equals one, then it's P of X. And if Y equals minus one, then it's Q of X. So in other words, I could have also written R of X and Y equals, you know, one half. Okay, P of X, if Y equals one, and Q of X, if 
y equals minus 1. And you can easily check that this integral happens to be exactly 1. So this is the reason why we have the 1 half term. Because if I, you know, solve the integral dx, so the integral of p of x dx is 1, the integral of q of x dx is also 1. And so then I get, you know, 1 half, so with probability 1 half, y equals 1, and with probability 1 half, y equals minus 1. And so if I add those terms together, I get exactly 1. So if we look at that, well, then here we have that ratio, right? And so we train, we can train a classifier between it. So at any given point here, right, what we get is that, you know, r of x and y equals 1 divided by r of x and y equals minus 1. Well, that just happens to be, well, p of x over q of x. And as such, you can see that if I just manage to get my classifier correctly, then I can also go and design a corresponding coverage of corrector. Now, the good thing is we do know how to build a classifier, right? We've spent quite some time before discussing various tricks on how to get it. And on this slide, we have exactly the information that was asked for, namely that, you know, r of y equals one given x, so that's p of x over p of x plus q of x, therefore gives us that alpha is q of x over p of x, and that's also the same thing as r of y equals minus one divided by r of y equals one. Uh, and yeah, we got this mixed up, so there we go. It's a typo. Now, the good news is this gives us a super simple algorithm, namely just go and train a classifier between training and test set, reweight the training data with that ratio, and then you can use, you know, a generalization performance estimate to decide whether we even have covariance shift, covariance shift. Because the good thing is this doesn't just give us a fix, it also gives us a test statistic to tell us whether that fix is even needed. <clears throat> now let's look at what happens, right? So the original problem, you know, is just minimizing one over m L of yi of f of xi and w. This becomes changed into a weighted problem where, you know, we now have those weights alpha i, which tell us, you know, how much more typical in the test set a particular observation is than in the training set. But there are a couple of issues with that. The first thing is that the alphas are really estimates. They're not the truth, right? Because we don't have the full distributions available. If we did, then things would be really easy. But since we don't, that's a problem. So therefore, you know, we basically increase both variance and bias. Well, bias because the estimate may not be quite so right and because we may be penalizing things and variance just because, well, there's some statistical variation between it. <laughs> Another problem is that if P and Q are very different, then that coverage of correction may actually give us highly undesirable results. So let's take a concrete example. So let's say I want to find out, you know, where to get, you know, the best Bavarian food or maybe, let's say, the best Chinese food. And so I can go and ask an audience of students. Okay, that audience probably looks demographically a little bit different from the photo that I got, but be that as it may. So if I, for instance, you know, ask among the students' audience, you know, what's a good Chinese restaurant, then probably a substantial fraction of students might be really well qualified to give me a good answer. Okay, so if I then, and so covariative correction then would simply mean that I go and downweight, you know, the feedback from maybe the people who are not quite that experts at that based on, you know, where they grew up, and that will give me a good estimate. Okay, so that's great. Now let's assume that I want to find the best Bavarian restaurant. 
And while I think Bavaria is great and I grew up there, well, there aren't that many people in machine learning who are Bavarians. There are a few and they are usually good at hiding, but basically the point is you're not going to get a very large sample. And thus, if you were to only, you know, care about the Bavarians in terms of weighing, you know, how, you know, which restaurant might be good, you might end up with a sample of one or two or three to, you know, give you their opinion. Now, this is problematic for a number of reasons. Well, one of the things is you're now trading off the, you know, possibly non-expert opinion about good Bavarian food from a large audience for the expert opinion or the maybe opinion that you hope is an expert opinion on a much smaller set. So there is a much higher variance on that now much smaller set because you're now essentially just putting all of your eggs into a very small basket. And so therefore, you know, while the estimate may be less biased, it definitely has significantly higher variance. You can actually work that out numerically. And so there's something called an effective sample size. Effective sample size comes up in a number of different contexts. For instance, you can work, on, work out an effective sample size for, for covariate shift, but you can also work out an effective sample size if you just assume that you have you know, a Gaussian normal distribution. So let's say I have maybe a weighted sample mean, right? And in that case, I can ask, and let's assume that all the XIs, you know, are drawn from a normal distribution with some mean mu. And then maybe I have some variance sigma squared. And the key point is that this variance sigma squared, now since I'm taking a weighted combination, it gets squared by alpha i squared. So therefore, the variance on the weighted sample size is now the two norm squared of alpha times sigma squared. Now in the case where everything is evenly weighted, I get one over m. And it turns out that if I wanted to maximize the ratio between, you know, the two norm and the one norm, both squared, that you know, the largest effective sample size I could get is really just the true sample size. Now, why am I calling it effective sample size? Because this term here behaves exactly like you know, one over m. It behaves like one over m. Now, therefore I could just say, you know, m star is one over the two norm of alpha squared. Now the reason why I put the one norm squared on the nominator, so, so numerator is because I want to make sure that I don't get, you know, sidetracked by any lack of normalization. If the alpha is already properly normalized to one, then everything's fine. Then, you know, you can ignore that term in the numerator, but otherwise, you know, this just prevents things from going badly wrong because otherwise you could just easily go and multiply this by four and you would get, you know, something very different. But since you're multiplying the numerator and the denominator by four, everything's fine. Okay. Um, so how can we prevent that from happening? So in the context of, you know, the Bavarian beer hall, this would just mean that the effective sample size might collapse to one or two people in the audience as opposed to, you know, the entire audience. And you could reasonably argue that while biased, maybe, you know, the rest of the people in the audience might also have a good idea about Bavarian beer halls. Okay. So how to fix this? Well, one thing is you can try to prevent the largest alphas from being really large. And the other thing that you can do is you can try to prevent the smallest alphas from being really small. By ensuring that the smallest alpha, 
And so here I just showed how to clip the above term, right? So if this is alpha i, then what you would probably want to do is you might want to ensure that, you know, they are clipped from above and below. So if you have a really small alpha i, it means you're completely disregarding this observation for the purpose of generating an estimate. If the term is really high, it means you're giving this an outsize if weight. And you probably want to have neither of the two if you actually want to get good estimates. So let's look at key takeaways for that. So covariate shift assumes that you have, you know, some joint distribution P of X and Y, which can be decomposed into P of X and P of Y given X. And then I deploy in a case where I have some Q of X and Y, which is Q of X times P of Y given X. Now the label dependency for training and test is the same and the covariate distribution that can be quite different. Now, the way to fix it is you train a binary classifier between training and test set. And, you know, if the evidence is there that those two distributions are very different, then you can just, you know, use it to reweight some training data and, you know, you get some weights. Now, the last thing is you want to go and clip. So here again in the notes, as said, I just clipped, clipped it from above but I might also perform the following thing, namely max of this min term here, and then, you know, some lower bound L. And that ensures that I'm not completely disregarding some observations, but also that I'm not giving any other observations an excessive weight. And that concludes the second part of this class.